Hello, everyone. Welcome to the diagnostic, diagnosis specific session, Hyper IgE syndrome. My name is Kathy Antela. I am the Vice President of Education for the Immune Deficiency Foundation. Thank you for joining us today. Before we start, uh, just a few reminders that, um, first of all, please remember that everybody's treatment condition, even if they have the same diagnosis, is unique, and that information presented in this session should not be used as medical advice. And in all cases, individuals and caregivers should consult their healthcare professional. Also, please remember that on our journey, we may differ from someone with the same diagnosis. And the severity of primary immunodeficiency can also vary. And that we ask that everyone is supportive and respectful of one another. So now this session is presented by Dr. Alexandra Freeman. Freeman. Dr. Freeman is a pediatric infectious disease physician at the National Institute of Health, Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institute of Health. And she focuses on the diagnosis and management of primary immunodeficiencies. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Freeman. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here today. And um, I wish this whole COVID period had ended so we could have been in person. Um, but we will do the best we can do here uh, virtually. And as um, Kathy said, I'm happy to answer questions at the end as well. Um, so I'll be talking about hyper IgE syndromes. I see individuals. Um, the disorders referred to as hyper IgE syndromes at uh, the NIH. And I realized on my title slide, I put in stuff about me at NIH and I forgot to put in NIH. That was a little bit embarrassing. Okay, so when people refer to hyper IgE syndromes, um, they're referring to a syndrome characterized by high serum IgE, which is one of the antibodies that floats around in the blood, eczema, and recurrent skin and lung infections. But kind of within that group of um, disorders, there are now a bunch of different genetic ideologies that have been described. And each one of those has you know, new, unique features um, to it and kind of unique things that we look out for and um, different ways to kind of manage them. So um, I put a list here of some of the different diseases that have been referred to as hyper IgE syndromes, as well as some of the other uh, contributing clinical factors such as connective tissue changes, um, like we see with uh, flexible joints or severe allergies or uh, more significant viral infections or neurologic changes. And uh, for today, because we only have so much time, um, I'm mostly gonna focus on kind of the more common ones um, that not only the more common in general in the world, but um, that I see um, those caused by sat mutations, um, which is sometimes referred to as Job syndrome, um, as well as DOC8 deficiency. And I'll kind of briefly mention some of the others. And as was said in the introduction, you know, um, I'm going to talk a lot about my own clinical practice, um, but this doesn't mean that this applies to everybody, and um, we'll talk about some of the complications. Again, um, not everything um, applies to everybody. Great. Okay, so uh, this is, um, that is a painting of the biblical Job, um, and this disease was named after uh, the Job in the Bible in the 1960s. Several years later, IgE was identified, um, and then the name was changed to hyper IgE recurrent infection syndrome. And I think, you know, based on kind of where we learn about the disease or, you know, the local, uh, you know, um, teams, what they call it or what the families are calling it, you know, it does change. But um, this was kind of the original historical um, name. And there's Job, and it's because of this uh, biblical um, uh, figure of having, uh, you know, Job um, being smote with boils. Um, and you can see that in the quote here and there as well. So I'm going to talk first about some of the main clinical features of this disease that we see. Um, the presentation is usually right in birth or within the first couple weeks of life uh, with a rash. And you can see a newborn here whose mom was affected by the disease. And this newborn had this kind of eczema-like rash um, on the face. That's where we see this most commonly in the infants. Uh, and if you scrape the rash and do um, kind of look at it under the microscope, there's a lot of uh, type of white blood cell called eosinophils that can make you quite itchy. Uh, the eczema in Job syndrome, um, we often see that in children. It tends to get better as they get older. 
but it's really driven often by the colonization with the bacteria Staphylococcus aureus or Staph aureus or Staph, we often say. Um, and so, you know, we often give individuals either antibiotics to prevent Staph as well as trying different um, therapies to decrease the Staph on the skin, like, and I'll talk more about that later, like bleach baths or antiseptics. And with that, this, the eczema usually is um, fairly mild in this disease, but for some individuals, it really can be quite significant. Individuals often have recurrent boils as well, starting early in life. Um, you can see underneath this person's arm, the boil there, um, which is a pocket of pus. Um, if you put a needle in this, it's full of the bacteria, again, Staph aureus and the white blood cells, the neutrophils. Um, but uh, um, again, in this disease, um, the symptoms might not be that striking. So you can have a boil and not actually feel that sick from it. Um, we, we refer to these often as cold boils. Uh, they might not be that red or tender or hot, um, but sometimes they are. Um, but again, they are caused typically by the infection staph aureus. Um, individuals with this uh, usually have recurrent pneumonia starting early in life as well, um, the first several years of life. Number one cause, again, is staph aureus. Um, there's other causes too, like streptococcus, pneumonia, and haemophilus influenza. Um, and as I was saying with the boils, when the kids and adults have the infections with these organisms, they often don't look that sick. Um, you know, when you have a staph pneumonia in the setting Piper IgE syndrome, you might not have a fever, for instance, whereas outside of that in an otherwise healthy individual, you would have a lot of fever and feel really sick and have a high white blood cell count on your um, CBC. But here, all those things might be fairly normal. So these infections are often missed. Um, you have to kind of really look out for them. And um, as people get older, they can notice the symptoms within themselves. This is a chest CT of a patient that um, we followed. Um, and this was, uh, she was in her early 30s. And uh, I know probably a lot of you aren't used to looking at chest CTs. So you have to imagine that the individual is lying on their back, we're seeing at the feet, looking towards the head. Um, and this then is the back. This is the chest, this is the left, this is the left lung, and this is the right lung. And this is what lung tissue looks like. If you can see my pointer, hopefully you can all see my pointer. So the black is air, the very, very white is bone, and kind of this color white, this blob up here is the heart. Um, and all these kind of branches you've seen are from the blood vessels and the different airways going through the lungs. So on the right lung, all this big patch of white, which you can also see over here, is a big pneumonia. So in an otherwise healthy individual, someone with that degree of pneumonia would be extremely sick in the hospital. And for this individual, she was working when she actually had this chest CT done. And she had actually sent it up to us. She's like, you know, I got a chest CT over my lunch break. You know, I'm okay. And we're like, yikes, you know, you need to get in the hospital. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, but, you know, one of the problems in this disease is, you know, that the staph aureus is kind of destroying the lung tissue, which it would do in otherwise healthy individuals too. Um, but you know, you're kind of left with these holes in the lung and then those have trouble then um, regenerating. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, individuals also have trouble with candida infections. We call this uh, that they have chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. Um, so candida is uh, yeast um, and it causes thrush, you know, that's in the mouth, it can cause skin infections, it can cause nail infections. So you can see in this individual, um, all these fingernails that are involved. There's a lot of other things that also go into this diagnosis and makes it fairly unique among a lot of the immune deficiencies. About three quarters of the patients have scoliosis. This is a chest x-ray and you can see the spine, how it has a curve here, the spine should be straight. Um, patients usually have very flexible joints um, and as they get older, that can cause some arthritis. The baby teeth, you can see the teeth here with a couple extra teeth. The baby teeth tend not to fall out and so usually you have to have the teeth pulled and then the secondary or groin of teeth come in normally. The skull shape can be a little bit different. You can see um, that it doesn't look like it would be that smooth. It'd be kind of a little bump on the head here. Um, that's what we refer to as craniosynostosis. And there's usually then some downward kind of displacement of the brain a little bit. This usually doesn't cause any symptoms at all, but you, the arrow here is pointing towards the cerebellum part of the brain that can be down a little bit. Um, this brain MRI in this picture, is, see these little white spots? Those are not normal, um, but can occur normally as people get older. But the little white spots um, are reflect um, some small changes in blood vessels there. And then finally, in this picture here, is showing a coronary artery aneurysm. As people get older, there can be, um, in the middle-sized arteries, um, vessels can develop some aneurysmal kind of outpouching. 
And this is a heart angiogram. Um, and you can see where the red arrow is, that there is an aneurysm there. There often is a characteristic facial appearance as well. Um, the facial features tend to be a little bit coarse. Um, there's um, slightly kind of a larger nose. The eyes are a little bit deep set. There's kind of some asymmetry. Um, you know, I think sometimes you can tell because our patients, when they're in the waiting room, can kind of pick out each other as having the disease. This is just, this is um, a little bit old from our cohort, this slide, but showing that people often have a lot of fractures um, without meaning to have any fractures. So very small traumas, like playing golf one time, um, doing the golf swing, someone broke their arm. Um, so a lot of our patients can have um, fractures, about half of them have had fractures without having a known trauma um, and have some degree of osteoporosis, although um, these don't totally correlate with each other. There can be intestinal symptoms as well. A fair number of our patients sometimes feel like things are getting caught in their esophagus or they're having some reflux. Um, and when people look in there, um, sometimes we can see eosinophilic esophagitis when the eosinophils, that's the type of white blood cell, kind of gets stuck you know, in the esophagus and kind of lead to this, um, that the esophagus not moving very smoothly. Um, but not frequently, but you know, occasionally in about six of our patients out of, you know, so in about 3% of our patients, they've had intestinal perforations where the intestines suddenly have a hole in them and um, we don't always know why. Sometimes it's because they have diverticuli, kind of an outpatching of the colon, um, but we're trying to understand that a little bit better. So, you know, I started taking care of individuals with hyper IgE syndrome at the NIH in 2005. And when I started, you know, we had no idea what was causing this and we were really confused because here was a disease where the patients were having staph infections and pneumonias, but also their baby teeth didn't fall out. And, you know, it was really quite perplexing. In 2007, though, the genetic cause of the disease was found and was found to be caused by STAT3 mutations. In the next slide, I'll show you a little bit more what that is. Um, and this was identified in Japan and then um, right after by our group at the NIH in Maryland. So this is just going through a little bit about what STAT3 does. So STAT3, the S-T-A-T stands for Signal Transduction and Activation Transcription. So we'll take that in two parts. Signal transduction is the first part. So signal transduction is just how do you get your signal across from cell to cell? So cells, when they talk to each other, they secrete lots of different molecules. And some of those are called cytokines, they're inflammatory molecules. And I listed some of them here, like IL-6, IL-10. Anyways, those then bind to a receptor on a certain cell surface. So they bind to the receptor. That starts off a whole pathway where something called JAK gets phosphorylated. And then STAT3 in this case gets phosphorylated, which just means it gets a phosphorus group put on it. And then it dimerizes, which means that two STAT3s bind to each other. And then, so that's the signal transduction part, getting the signal from the other cell to STAT3. And then STAT3, the second half of the, the AT part is activation transcription, which means how does a cell then make a protein to make things happen? So STAT3 you know, binds with itself. So there's two of them stuck together. They then go into the nucleus and do transcription, which means that they turn genes on or off. Um, and STAT3 is expressed by almost all cells in the body. And it's a key mediator for many of the pathways, like those of the immune system and cancer and wound healing, vascular remodeling. So um, it began to make a little bit more sense why so many different parts of the body are involved here. So when we have patients with this, they have a mutation, so a change in STAT3. So when the STAT3 then binds to its partner here, that is all abnormal. And although there is some normal STAT3 protein there, it's not working normally. So you see less of the um, proteins then being turned on like, than they should be. So then we begin to understand a little bit about the immune problems that we see in this disease. So um, as I said, when the patients have a lot of trouble with candida affecting the mucosal and the skin surfaces, that's what I mean here by epithelial and the mucosa. So on the skin and on the nails and in the mouth and sometimes on the intestinal tract. And um, there's a certain type of lymphocyte of the, called the TH17 lymphocytes that are involved in the control of this. So based on kind of what's going on in the surrounding um, body and the kind of where the cell is, um, based on kind of what's going on, the T lymphocytes can actually differentiate and grow up to either um, fight like intracellular bacteria, like certain bacteria, or they can be involved in allergy or asthma, or they can be involved to prevent autoimmunity. That's called the T reg cells. So there's Th1 with um, certain different type of bacteria, Th2 with others, the T regulatory cells, which are involved in autoimmunity. 
Anyway, some of them grew up to be called Th17 cells, and they're involved in this um, mucosal immunity and trying to prevent infections such as candida. Um, and the people that have the STAT3 mutations, which in this graph are reflected as red, really don't make those Th17 cells to then fight those infections. And we think that contributes to some of the candida infections as well as the um, staph infections. Individuals also have less memory T and B lymphocytes. So um, when the lymphocytes are first born, they initially are quite naive. And then as they get educated in terms of what infections they treat, they become memory cells. Um, so we see less of those memory cells in these individuals. And if you have less memory in the T lymphocytes, T lymphocytes are very important for, infection, for viral infections. And um, chickenpox is an example of that. So they have plenty of the kind of early on T lymphocytes. So individuals don't have a lot of trouble with viral infections. So if you get chickenpox like this baby did when she was you know, quite young, it's not a problem for these individuals. We just try to make sure that they don't get a secondary staph infection on top, but then they don't have the memory. And chicken pox is one of those viruses that lives in your body for the rest of your life. And if the memory of kind of how to fight it goes down, then you get shingles. And that's why as people get older, they get shingles vaccine to kind of boost that memory. So we see in these individuals, um, you know, um, not all the time, but more than we should expect to have shingles erupt. And this is um, an individual, a kid here around 10 years old with one kind of stripe of the characteristic graphs of shingles. Then it's not particularly severe for these people, like, you know, not more so than anybody else. Um, it's just that they don't have that memory to keep it in check. And same with their lack of memory B lymphocytes. So these are the, um, the B lymphocytes that make antibodies. So because of that, often um, the kind of vaccine responses to antibodies kind of go away or other antibody responses to other infections. And because of this, many individuals end up on immune globulin replacement. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is that IgE being high, people always assume that there's lots and lots of allergies. And, um, and some of these patients do have a fair amount of allergies. But when we look at others with really high IgEs, and again, IgE is kind of what causes allergy. And when we look at other diseases or other disease processes um, where there's high IgE, we see a lot less allergy than we would expect. So this is a study done at our group. Um, and this is a food allergy. And this is otherwise healthy individuals. And these are people that have the same IgE amount in the gray and the white here. So in the gray, those individuals um, have the sat mutation, the white don't. So you can see there's a lot less allergy in these individuals. And if you look at anaphylaxis, which is on the other side, the graph there, um, you can see it's even um, less um, anaphylaxis. So despite having a lot of IgE floating around, including IgE to things like peanut, that IgE doesn't actually cause the horrible anaphylactic reactions that we would see in otherwise um, you know, people that don't have a SAT3 mutation. Um, and we have various reasons that we think um, explains that. But, you know, it doesn't mean that someone with a SAT3 mutation can't have anaphylaxis or allergies, because they can. Um, it's just that we don't see it as much as we would expect. But, you know, as I was saying before, SAT3 is involved in so many different pathways that it's very confusing in terms of, you know, what, how is it causing so many different things that are going on? Um, and especially when we think about things like the bone disease and the joints and the teeth, it's been very hard for us to figure out exactly what's going on. Um, one kind of um, thing that we recognized um, kind of in around 2005 um, was about the aneurysms. That's helped us think a little bit more about kind of what causes some of the other kind of parts of this disease. So this is a patient that we follow in his 40s. He had um, several risk factors actually for heart disease. He had high cholesterol and high blood pressure, or he still does. Um, but, and he had had a heart attack. Um, luckily he did okay um, and came down to our hospital for evaluation. So he had a heart angiogram. And this is the picture I showed you before um, with a red arrow pointing to where um, we expected to see narrowing of the arteries like you would expect for people with high cholesterol and other problems like that but he did not have that. He actually had this big aneurysm and within the aneurysm, which is kind of an outpouching of an artery, and when the, within the aneurysm, a clot had formed leading to the heart attack. Next to this, this is the heart CT. And on the heart CT, um, we found that he actually had an aneurysm in another vessel as well, as well as his right coronary artery being very dilated. 
So we started him on antiplatelet medicine, and since then he hasn't had any recurrence of the heart disease. Um, and we also found that he didn't have the um, kind of the narrowing that we would expect to see with someone with his risk factors. But this kind of started our group to focus a little bit on the aneurysms that you can see in this disease. So since that time, we screen all of our patients um, once they can lie in an MRI or if they're able to lie in an MRI or um, sometimes for the older individuals, we'll do this by CAT scan, but we'll look at the coronary arteries and look for aneurysms. And we found that a fair amount of them, number of them as they get older, either have very wiggly arteries. Um, and you can see kind of in the middle there where the arrow is, um, you can see that artery looks very um, wiggly there, um, or you can see aneurysms. Um, so, you know, it's important for us to screen because then we can try to put the patient on medicines to try to prevent them from having um, any events such as a myocardial, such as a heart attack. Um, we also screen the patients for cerebral artery aneurysms. Luckily, uh, we've only found a couple over the years, um, but that could cause bleeding. So we do screen to make sure that that's taken care of. Um, so that doesn't put them at risk of having these issues. Um, we can also see some aneurysms in the bronchial arteries, which can go on to lung bleeding. And you know, so we focus a lot on controlling the infection and inflammation in the lungs to make that most common. Um, and rarely, it can also infect intestinal arteries and cause um, intestinal bleeding. But you know, seeing those aneurysms has made us think a lot more about kind of tissue remodeling or wound healing in this disease. So um, back when I was, we were looking a few slides ago at the Staph aureus pneumonia, and I talked about, um, you know, the inflammation kind of eats away at the normal parts of the lungs. So uh, that happens, you know, in anyone that has a bad pneumonia. But typically, individuals will then kind of, their lungs can regenerate and kind of remodel and look, you know, pretty close to normal again. But in this disease, that isn't the case, and they can be left with these kind of holes in their lung. So you can see here um, where the kind of pinkish arrow is, um, there's a big hole in that individual's lung. And within that hole, um, some mold has moved in. Because once a hole is there, then it's easier for other infections to kind of set in. Um, and also we can see bronchiectasis, which is from also like dilated airways, which can cause some chronic infection. So we think that is because the, um, the lung tissues don't remodel normally or they don't heal normally. And we see the same thing after lung surgery. So on the top chest CT here, you can see that um, there's the big sign of infection um, where you can see that fluid there, exactly where the arrow is pointing, if you can't see my black arrow. Um, and then, um, so I realized probably no one can see my black arrow that I'm using all the time. Um, so I like it when the little white one appears. And then that individual actually had that big infected area removed, um, but then you know the lung couldn't heal after the surgery. So when the lung can't heal after surgery, then you can end up with what we call an air leak or a bronchial pleural fistula. Um, and then you need to have a chest tube to make sure the air that's in building up too much outside of the lung. So this poor guy had a chest tube for many, many months while the lung healed. Again, showing evidence that the tissues don't remodel normally. So because of that, you know, we really try to prevent patients from having lung surgeries or we warn them about this and the surgeons about this because it can be very hard to heal then after lung surgery. We've been doing a bunch of research at NIH to try to understand um, kind of why tissues don't remodel normally. Um, and we found that um, there's a bunch of different proteins, and these are kind of more sciencey sites, but um, that are involved in tissue remodeling in which, um, you know, we see kind of abnormal responses. So if you look on the left where it says fibroblasts, that's there. Um, so these different colorful bars on this um, graph you can see three of them here called MMP1, 3, and 9. That stands for matrix metalloproteinases, and they're involved in tissue remodeling. And so what we did here was we took um, from skin cells, fibroblasts, fibroblasts are involved in tissue healing and uh, wounds, um, and we put them in the setting of kind of inflammation. And you can see the three big bars, kind of the bright pink, green, and the lighter blue, they all went way up after the stimulation. And then you can see right next to them, the three bars that are staying very low. And those were three patients with SAT3 mutation. So you can see that that normal kind of response of these connective tissue proteins kind of going in there to clean up things wasn't there. On the right here, again, from skin cells, we can make these kind of like tumory type cells and um, where you can see the blood vessels. And when you look at the, the one from the, um, 
that's created um, by the cells with Seth U mutation compared to the control, you can see how white and small it looks. It's because the normal blood vessels aren't going in there and um, kind of cause, making all these little blood vessels. So we realize there's problems with blood vessel growth. And that's been important for us because now we had to figure out, okay, how can we reverse that um, and you know, give these individuals better kind of function of STAT3 and um, to make the blood vessels more normal and to make tissue remodeling more normal. So, you know, this disease really does have an evolving prognosis. Um, and, you know, back um, years ago, you know, when I started, you know, the, the um, you know, uh, it, it was kind of, a, you know, a very hard disease and people often had really significant lung disease. And um, sadly, you know, we, we would have individuals not survive past often, you know, the 30s, um, 40s. Um, luckily, that's really changing. And every single time we look, the average age these individuals survive keeps getting longer and longer. And, you know, now um, we have a bunch of patients in the 60s, which, you know, was really not the case um, a bunch of years ago. And, you know, pretty soon I expect us to have a bunch of patients in the 70s because, you know, our 60 ones are getting older. So, um, so we've been happy about that. And, but I think, um, you know, and, and we hope that that keeps getting, you know, further and further extended. Um, so I think we're doing a lot better managing the infections for these patients. Um, but, you know, we do see problems um, emerging now um, as people are living a lot longer. One thing is the aneurysms I mentioned before. And another thing is that, um, you know, the, the um, younger people with this disease often have very flexible joints, but as they get older, then they can have trouble with those joints and it causes arthritis. And um, here's an x-ray of someone that had a hip replacement um, when she was 55 years old. And that's what we're seeing um, kind of in the lower graph here is that as people are getting older, we're seeing more orthopedic events. I mean, you know, not life-threatening events, but events where they have to have surgery to help, you know, their spine or their hips or their knees or their shoulders, um, as well as kind of the um, aneurysms up here. So, you know, I feel like we've done better now understanding some of the infections and the immunology of this disease. And now we have to kind of go back and really focus holistically to improve everything in um, the patient's quality of life. So one of the questions that's been coming up in recent years when those of us are involved in this disease talk is what is the role of bone marrow transplant? Because um, bone marrow transplant, as um, probably many of you know, is used a lot for other severe immune deficiencies, um, like SCID, for instance, um, where babies all go to transplant or um, sometimes to gene therapy very early in life. Um, and this is an immune deficiency, although obviously compared to skin, it's not as much of an emergency as I was just saying. Some people are living now much, much, much um, longer. Um, but, you know, there are still some people that end up with significant infections and um, bad skin disease and bad lung disease. Um, so, you know, it always makes us wonder, could we just correct the immune system? Um, so, you know, people thought about that years ago. Um, and on top here is a paper that came out in 2000 um, that written by a British group and says, bone marrow transplant does not correct the hyper IgE syndrome. So, you know, this really put a damper on the field of transplant for obvious reasons um, and hyper IgE syndrome. Because those authors said they transplanted their patient, everything seemed great for a year or two, and then all the symptoms came back. Now, it's interesting, those same authors later on said, you know what, we actually think we're wrong about this paper. And they think that that person actually did better than they expected um, for years afterwards and really had less infections. Um, but, you know, everyone was a little hesitant until the paper on the bottom there that I have a picture of its title, that was in 2010, Successful Long-Term Immunologic Reconstitution by Allogeneic Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplant Cures Patients with Autosomal Dominant Hyper IG Syndrome. So this was two boys, teenagers, um, both with set mutations that were transplanted. And those authors said, you know what, they actually did really well after transplant. Some of those things I was telling all of you about earlier, like the TH17 cells, they became normal, the infections went away, their, um, some of the facial features weren't as severe, the bones got better. Um, so people really started reevaluating transplant after that point. And the British group, um, you can see AR Genry, that's Dr. Genry, um, Professor Genry, who's a wonderful, great um, doctor. He um, and those in Great Britain have gone on now to do eight transplants in this disease. And they think overall, it's not correcting everything, but does seem to help some of the infections in this disease. And we should consider it for some patients, not for all patients, because you know we don't want to 
patient to go through a bone marrow transplant that can be a life-threatening thing to go through if we think that they're going to do fairly well living, you know, to be in their 60s, 70s, and hopefully beyond. Um, but somehow we need to figure out who won't be doing as well. So that's a topic of conversation. We actually had a, um, a Zoom meeting the other day um, with a bunch of different countries and us talking about that. And we're all putting together our resources um, and our data to try to figure out, you know, how can we figure out who could benefit from this? Um, at NIH, we have seen over the years, we've seen over 150 patients. Um, and um, right now we have transplanted three patients. They all were children that seemed to be worse than the typical child with this disease. Um, and we have plans to transplant another one in the next month and probably another couple in the next year. Um, and probably around the world, maybe 15 to 20 patients have been transplanted with this disease. And some good outcomes are being reported, um, but not all, you know. Um, so I think that's why it's a little bit tricky and probably the way the transplant is performed is also important. Um, and we're not great at predicting from the actual mutation, what is the exact change in SAT3? Who will do well, who won't? But that's why, you know, we are having these Zoom talks to try to figure out what other factors can help us decide that. Um, and then we have to realize, you know, what will get better and what won't. You know, we do think after transplant, there'll be less infections, you know, less eczema, less candida infections, less staph infections. Will the bone issues be improved? Maybe. The Greek authors seem to think so. Um, that has not been our experience at NIH yet. How about the blood, blood vessel changes? You know, probably not. Um, that probably doesn't have to do with the immune cells that will be replaced. Or what if there's a lung infection after the transplant, would the healing after that be better? You know, for that, we really don't know. Okay, so now just to kind of wrap up some of the STAT3 um, part of this talk. So the diagnosis of this disease. Um, we do genetic testing when there's consistent signs and symptoms. You know, a lot of people can have really high IgEs and it's just from infections. So we um, think about this disease when there's both the infections as well as rash, as well as some of the non-immune system findings, such as scoliosis fractures, the retained primary teeth, or flexible joints. Um, we often think it's not going to be the case if there's really a lot of allergies in anaphylaxis. Some allergies in anaphylaxis is fine, but if there's a lot, we think, oh, maybe it'll be a different cause of high IgE. Um, and then to diagnose this disease, um, you have to just sequence the gene, um, which is SAT3. And there are different ways to do that, um, like some places just sequence that gene. Um, some um, genetic companies have panels, like such as a hyper IgE panel, or there's primary immune deficiency panels, or there's whole exome sequencing. So there's different approaches to doing sequencing at this point. And then the approach to care. Most of the approach right now is supportive with suppressive antimicrobials. Um, we typically give individuals an antibiotic to try to decrease the amount of staph infections, really trying to um, avoid the pneumonias if possible. We use trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole most frequently, that's Bactrim. Um, and for individuals that have um, frequent recurrence of uh, yeast, we'll often have them on antifungal as well. If there's mold in their lungs or holes in their lungs that would cause mold, we um, typically have them on an antifungal or an anti-mold agent for that. There are certain parts of the country that can have different types of fungi, for instance, in their soil. And then we think about that as well. Um, for instance, there's one in the Southwest called coccidioides or coxi, and that can cause um, severe infections for these patients. So we make sure if they are in the Southwest, as I said travel plans, but also living plans, that they're on an antifungal. Um, we like individuals to be on antiseptics as well, um, such as dilute bleach baths. We usually recommend about a half a cup of bleach into a cup of, um, half a cup of bleach into a tub um, and to bathe in that um, three days a week. Immediately after the bleach, you know, to put on moisturizers because um, it can be drying. Or chlorhexidine, um, that's trained in the semiclines, or swimming in chlorinated water. Because that really helps to decrease the amount of staph on the skin and um, helps to control the eczema. Uh, we consider immune globulin replacement uh, or supplementation, either IVIG or sub-Q, IG. Not all the patients seem to need this. Um, but when we're seeing recurrent infections despite antibiotics and if the immune globulins antibody responses are low, then we um, typically think use this. Maybe in about half of our patients. We think about the bone and the dental health. We make sure there's good dental care um, to know when to take out the baby teeth so that the secondary teeth can come in. And uh, we check vitamin D levels to make sure that um, there aren't other causes of osteoporosis and fractures. 
uh, we'd like to make sure that all the families know that um, the infections might not have all the typical signs and have a low suspicion then for looking for infections. Um, and then, you know, as I said, in rare cases, we'll consider bone marrow transplant as well. I think, and then the next couple slides are just kind of illustrating um, some of the points about the care of the patients. This is not um, a slide of a study done in uh, Job syndrome, but this is a slide of a study done in um, individuals with eczema. This was published in 2009, but this was using bleach baths as well as mupirocin to the nose for a week um, every month. And uh, the lower you go on the score, um, the better the eczema is controlled. So you can see here in the red, those with the bleach baths are a lot better than placebo. So bleach baths are helpful for eczema with or without um, a septic mutation. And then um, a lot of individuals that have this disease end up with bronchiectasis, um, which is you know, from some of the scarring in their lung, where you can have chronic then mucus um, in the lungs and uh, infections related to that. And when that is present, then the infections can change. You can have pseudomonas, which is a bacteria in there. You can have molds like aspergillus or non tuberculous spectrum bacteria. And it's really important at this point to get sputum cultures when sick, so you know which antibiotics to use to target the infections that are present. Um, we also then use um, airway clearance techniques because if you can get a bunch of the mucus out, then there'll be less um, trouble with the infections. Um, we like hypertonic saline nets, so that's 3% or 7% saline after albuterol to kind of help clear out the lungs or airway clearance devices. There's aerobica, there's acapella, there's all sorts of different ways. Azithromycin um, can be helpful um, if mycobacteria are not present. It uh, acts as like an anti-inflammatory. Um, and cystic fibrosis for bronchiectasis, they use vests. Occasionally we use a vest. You just have to make sure that it's not gonna cause a rib problem, like a rib fracture. Okay, I'm switching gears now. Now we'll talk about a different hyper-IgE syndrome. This one um, used to be referred to as autosomal recessive hyper-IgE syndrome and uh, it's called DOC8 deficiency. So um, DOC8 deficiency is more rare than uh, staph 3 deficient hyper-IgE syndrome. Um, but you know, we are a center for this at the NIH um, and see people from all over the United States as well as all over the world. Um, this is uh, what we refer to as a combined immune deficiency. It's both B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes and tends to get worse as people get older. Um, it's characterized by eczema. Um, it can be mild and it can be extremely severe. Some of the eczema can be much, much worse than we see with STAT3 deficient patients. Um, allergies as well, asthma. And then we see ear, sinus and lung infections. But what sets this apart is some of the viral skin infections. You can see on the hands of this individual, you can see this is all warts. Um, which are very common in this disease. And then on the neck here, this is a different type of viral skin infection called molluscum. Um, and we see um, an increased incidence of cancers with lymphoma and squamous cell carcinoma. The squamous cell carcinoma is caused by the virus that causes warts, um, which is the HPV virus. This is a worse disease, and this is a pure immune deficiency. So when um, someone is diagnosed with this, I think everyone is pretty much is in agreement now that um, bone marrow transplant should be um, undertaken, you know, as soon as that can be arranged. Um, you know, not, it's not an emergency as much as it is with SCID, the severe combined immune deficiencies, but, you know, it's something that we don't want to wait too long to um, get done. So, because, you know, uh, many of the patients, about half of the patients don't survive past age 20, and many of the patients have life-threatening events by the age of 20 years old. So this is a much more severe disease and a disease that we try to um, fix as best we can through bone marrow transplantation. Um, we do see complications as people get older. There can be bronchiectasis. Sometimes we can see uh, vascular changes. So in the um, top middle picture, um, that is a brain MRA that's looking at the blood vessels in the brain. And if you look at the um, blood vessels kind of on the top left compared to the top right there, um, the white squiggly things are all the blood vessels. You can see that the two sides aren't symmetric and that's because of a, um, um, because of blood vessel changes um, in the brain. Um, you can see an aneurysm here as well. And then these are pictures of um, lymphoma on the bottom and cryptosporidia, which is a parasite that can cause liver disease. So we do bone marrow transplants. It's um, fun as a doctor to see the warts kind of, you know, Rewarding, I guess is a better word, not fun, but to um, see the warts disappear um, several months after the bone marrow transplant when everything is going well and we're all feeling happy. Um, this is the knees going away and then the fingers. 
Um, this is a patient with lymphoma that wasn't responding to chemotherapy and um, all the black spots there, um, except for the heart, which is supposed to be black, um, then all melted away. And this patient is more than five years out now from a lymphoma after transplant. The eczema also clears up really nicely. Sometimes we'll do wraps, skin wraps, to improve it before transplant as well. But then the eczema clears up. So DOC8 deficiency, just to summarize, the IgE can be variable, the eczema and allergies can be variable, um, but the skin viral infections get worse and the malignancy, the cancer risk increases as people get older. So it's important to diagnose this at a young, you know, and then go to transplant um, fairly quickly. Um, it can be hard in the first few years of life because it can look like eczema and um, allergies. Um, and the diagnosis is through genetics. In terms of treatment, um, I can't emphasize enough, as I keep saying that the bone marrow transplant, um, you know, we either do match-related donors or unrelated donors, and our center has a lot of experience now with haploidentical donors, where you know, a parent or a sibling can sometimes be used, even if they're not a full match. And until transplant, um, we use prophylactic antibiotics, typically um, trimethoprim sulfa. Um, we consider azaclovir or valacyclovir, that's for um, recurrent herpes or shingles, it's an antiviral. Um, most patients are on immune globulin replacement with IVIG or sub-Q IG. Interferon alpha has been used for warts or severe viral um, disease, but can have a lot of side effects, including depression. So these days, we just try to go to transplant. Okay, so now I'm just going to really briefly, very, very briefly, mention a couple of the other newer genetic um, defects causing hyper-IgE syndrome. And this is kind of a um, science pathway slide, but just to make the point that there were two genetic changes identified in the last couple of years, one in a gene called CARD11 and one in a gene called CARD14. They both are very similar places in the immune system, I mean, in the same kind of pathway of the body, um, except CARD11 is um, involved in kind of activation of these immune pathways um, in the lymphocytes or in the um, white blood cells, and CARD14 is in the skin cells. CARD11. So, you know, over the last several years, there's been a bunch of different genetic causes of disease and immune deficiency and other um, diseases where there's mutations that it can either cause GOF, which is gain of function, where the gene works over time, or loss of function, um, where the gene isn't working as well. So um, CARD11, if you have a mutation that causes it to work too much, then you get B-cell lymphoproliferative disease or big lymph nodes. If it's just too much in certain um, lymphocytes, then you can end up with lymphoma. If you lose both copies of your gene, then it's like severe combined immune deficiency. If it's just one copy of the gene that has a mutation that makes it work not as well, loss of function, then you get allergies and you can have skin viral infections like molluscum or sinus or lung infections. And some of those patients can have mildly decreased IgG as well. CARD14, um, also you can have mutations that cause it to work too much gain of function where the patient gets psoriasis or they can have loss of function mutations where the patients can have very severe eczema. This seems to be a rare disease, um, but the individuals we've seen have really severe eczema and asthma, anaphylaxis, um, get skin infections as well. Um, another disease was described in the last couple of years called ZNF341 deficiency. That's autosomal recessive, which means both copies of your gene have to have a mutation to cause the disease. This is a transcription factor, which means that it promotes the working of STAT3. So it makes the STAT3 be expressed and work better. Um, so when it's not there, if the patients have that deficiency, STAT3 can't work very well. And so there's a lot of common problems then with STAT3 deficient hyper IgE syndrome. But these patients tend to have a more intense inflammation response. And finally, um, in last year, there was um, mutations described in a gene called the IL-6ST. Um, so that's in the IL-6 receptor. IL-6 is one of those cytokines, those inflammatory molecules that I mentioned, that then signals through STAT3. So some of the um, functions then um, that are done by STAT3 um, cannot happen. These individuals get similar kind of destructive lung disease that similar to the um, patients with uh, STAT3 deficient hyper IgE syndrome with the big holes in their lungs and the pneumatoceles that can have trouble with aspergillus and ABPA, which is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillus disease, as well as some of the connective tissue changes like the um, teeth missing. Um, this is just a table looking at a bunch of the different genetic um, causes of um, hyper IgE. 
and some of the different um, findings. For instance, with the uh, dominant negative SAT3, that's uh, the hyper Job syndrome, um, where we see a lot of the connective tissue changes as well as infections. Block 8 deficiency, where you see more of the pure immune deficiency in the viral skin infections. PGM3 deficiency is another one I didn't talk about. That is neurologic issues. We just talked about CAR-11 and CAR-14 and the others. And finally, just thank you all for your attention. Um, I highlighted here some of my team at the NIH, as well as some of my collaborators, both at NIH and um, kind of around the country. And this is just a picture of the little mouse that was made at NIH to be a mouse model of the disease um, with the SAT3 mutation. <laughs> thank you so much. And now I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. Okay, so um, participants, you feel free to um, send your questions through the chat feature. I don't, oh, here we go. Now they're sending their questions. This is yep. wonderful. Thank you. First question, are there non-invasive tests that one can take to identify the likeness of one to pass hyper-IgE into, onto future children? So that's a great question. Um, I didn't talk about that very much. I mean, I use the words dominant and recessive, um, but I didn't really talk about that. So I'm clearly, I, I should have. Um, so, you know, it depends, the likelihood of whether or not it will pass on really depends on what's causing it. So um, for instance, the first disease I talked about, the STAT3 deficient hyper IgE syndrome, Job syndrome, that in that disease, an individual that's affected with that has one normal copy of STAT3 gene, because everyone has two copies of every gene, unless it's excellent. So there's one normal copy and one copy that has the change that's present. And so um, for their children, they could either inherit the normal copy or they can inherit the abnormal copy. So this is a 50% chance for each child. So with that disease, if the child has the mutation, they definitely have the disease. And so there's a 50% chance. Um, Luckily, the children um, that are being identified when they've had a parent that's affected, those children were diagnosing at birth and seeming to do thus far really quite well when we diagnose them early on. Um, but um, other diseases, if it's recessive, for instance, BRCA8 deficiency, that's when both copies have the change. So either copy that you pass on will be affected, but you need both copies to be affected to pass it on. And so then if the other parent has a normal copy of the children, there's no chance that they'll pass on to them. So then it really depends on kind of the chance for both um, parents. Um, but there's a lot of, we, lot of people that have high IgE and we don't know why, you know, it's from allergies and there's probably multiple um, genes that are involved. Um, and then it's a little bit harder to predict. Let's see, and then there's the question right here, what is the difference between genetic versus spontaneous mutation? So um, when the mutation Everything is genetic when it's affecting one of the genes. When it's causing a change in one of the genes, it's genetic. Although, you know, the, the change in that gene has to start somewhere, right, before it's passed on. So um, we're all having changes happen in our genes. Like all, all of us, if we look and we do whole exome sequencing for all of us, there's a lot of variation. And that's often from, you know, when things are copied, there's always some spontaneous changes. It's just when they happen to occur in a really important spot that causes disease that it can be problematic. So I would say for about a third of our patients with um, the STAT3 mutations, they're the first person in the family. That little change just happened to happen in the STAT3 gene where it was causing a problem and then it can be passed on to their family members 50% of the time. But for them, it was a spontaneous mutation. They were the first in the family and then it can be passed on. I hope that makes sense. Um, Thank you. Oh, COVID. <laughs> I was thinking about that. I feel like I was finally like, oh, I'm just going to talk about hyper IgE, not talk about COVID. So um, the SAT3 hyper IgE patients, how are they affected by COVID? Um, there's some theories that will be less severe. So I'll tell you about our experience thus far. Um, so, you know, we follow about 120 patients with uh, SAT3 um, mutated hyper IgE syndrome, or Job syndrome. And, um, you know, when the COVID pandemic started, of course, you know, we suggested to all of our patients and we're suggesting still, you know, the better you can isolate yourselves, the better. Because um, we really just don't know the answer to this question. And, you know, just like myself, without an immune deficiency, I mean, I'm careful, you know, in terms of wearing my mask and washing my hands all the time and trying to avoid crowded sightings and, 
doing everything. You know, I, I was I was really concerned about my patients and wanted them to be extra careful. You know, probably even more than me. So, um, you know, most of our patients have not gotten COVID. Um, I think because people have been really careful and people with immune deficiency. You know, a number of my patients have remarked on this. They already were leading a life where they were pretty careful. You know, so they became more careful. But you know, it's kind of like oh, the rest of the world now is being careful um, as well. So, um, but we have had at least three of our patients with step three mutations have um, gotten COVID at this time. Um, and I know of a couple others from around the world. Our three patients, all uh, two of the three had some mild chronic lung disease, like a small pneumatocy or a little bit of bronchiectasis. And um, none of our three patients that have been affected ended up in the hospital. One of them was in his forties, one's in their twenties, and one is a teenager. None of them were hospitalized. One of them, um, I did give an extra antibiotic to about midway through because I was a little bit worried. Um, but, um, but again, they all had fairly mild disease, no hospitalization. And that has been true around the world too. I think only one person that I know of has been hospitalized. And um, that was just because they were worried because of the um, immune deficiency that was in a different country. Now, that being said, I wouldn't take that those three patients had mild disease. I mean, that everyone will have mild disease. I mean, it's only three patients. We really don't know. So I'm still encouraging all my patients to be, you know, to you know, be very careful about this. And I really worry about the individuals that already have underlying significant lung disease. Because some people with this disease already have a fair amount of lung disease and getting any type of respiratory virus can be a big deal. Um, but um, one other thing about COVID is that um, you know, in, in otherwise healthy people, a lot that get COVID that have severe cases, a lot of the severity comes from kind of the second half of the illness where you have this intense inflammatory response. And some of that intense inflammatory response is driven by some of the cytokines that have trouble signaling in these patients like IL-6. And some of the treatments that are being used around the country and around the world are things like tocilizumab that block that. And that's already kind of blocked in the staph reputation mutated patients, which is why we wonder if it would be, you know, maybe we're not seeing that kind of severe second half of it. But again, I'm really trying to encourage people not to test these theories because we really, really don't know. Okay. We've got about five minutes left and um, here I'll, we'll see how quickly we can go. How many patients have lost their esophagus or have had severe esophag esophagus problems? Same question for cornea transplants. Oh, okay. Um, the esophagus, I don't, I mean, none of, none of my patients have lost an esophagus. Um, they've all had their esophagus. Um, some of them have had um, nissen fundoplications where they have severe reflux disease and they actually have a surgery to help with that. Um, but I would say a lot of my patients, maybe half of my patients end up on medicines to decrease reflux disease. Um, so having esophageal symptoms is fairly common. Some of them have also had to have dilations to try to improve kind of the function of their esophagus. Um, corneal transplants, I don't think, I've, I don't think any of my patients have had a corneal transplant. Um, we've had a, um, several patients be treated for glaucoma or retinal um, detachments, but I'm sorry, I don't know of anyone with a corneal transplant except in PGM3 deficiency. I had one patient that had a corneal transplant for severe herpes infection with, um, PGM3 deficiency and had a corneal transplant that was okay for a long time. Um, okay. Okay, next question. If someone with STAT3 is diagnosed, does it have to be passed down genetically? Yes, yeah, so it doesn't, so if someone has a STAT3 mutation, every one of their children would have a 50% chance of having um, it be passed on to the children. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have to be passed on because it could just be that chance that it's the 50% that's not. Um, but uh, every child would have the 50% risk, um, you know, and there are different things that an OB can do to try to look for the mutation, you know, if, if wanted before the baby is born. Um, we've tested the babies right when they're born as well to diagnose it, to try to decrease the severity if it's present. And um, going along with your 50%, one of our participants said they have two children. One has um, hyper IgE syndrome and the other doesn't. So the next question, <laughs> how could or how would COVID e affect a hyper IgE patient, STAT3, if they already have lung damage? 
so um, so the patients with so when you have already have um, mucus in their lungs um, from bronchiectasis, then any respiratory infection, you know, if you just get a regular common cold like the, the old fashioned type of coronavirus, for instance, that can increase the amount of mucus. And if there's already bacteria there, like pseudomonas, can cause a bronchiectasis exacerbation. So that's kind of what we've been worried about. Um, also, you know, some of our patients that have really severe lung disease do need oxygen. Um, and I worry about that COVID could cause that oxygen need to go up, or they could end up with kind of an exacerbation of things because their airway clearance isn't as good. There's more mucus there for the bacteria to thrive. So that's my concern. Um, you mentioned that you should be cautious about lung surgery. What about bone surgery? And we've got about one minute left. Okay. Really quick. Okay, that's a great question. We have not seen the problems with bone surgeries that we have with lung surgeries. I think it's things that have like tubes in them. Like we've seen more problems from um, lung surgeries, a biliary, um, gallbladders removal. Also, we've never seen a problem. I think someone's had their appendix removed without a problem. Most, most colon surgeries without a problem. But um, one patient did have a problem after kind of a liver surgery with the tube issue. And bones and joints have been okay for the most part. Last question, and if we get cut off, um, we will follow up with um, you, Dr. Freeman, if there are a couple questions here that um, we need answers to and email the person. Um, do symptoms overlap between STAT3 and DOC8? Yes, yeah, so um, there's key differences, but both diseases can cause eczema, skin abscesses, um, lung infections like pneumonia, sinus infections, and um, ear infections, and have a high IgE. Some of the labs can look very similar initially. But as people get older, like, you know, DOC8 deficiency doesn't have the baby teeth that don't fall out, the joint issues, the scoliosis. So as, you know, once you enter like school age type years, it's pretty easy to tell those apart. Not easy, but you know, it gets, for those of us seeing them all the time, it's easier. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. Oh, Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, the exhibit hall is open, and at 2.30, we have Dr. Malik um, presenting a general session to everybody. Thank you. Wow, Dr. Malik, great. Thank you. Bye-bye.